reasons, you know, that uh, Stefan has been pushing with Natessi, et cetera, is that there are a lot of feelings of interchange. And one of the reasons is that when I, I this, most people didn't know this, but I actually was a novice programmer when I started writing mini events. I was really not, I did not really, I was not an expert programmer. I had not, I had no education. I had no real experience. I had never worked as a programmer. And basically, I started out as a hobby, hobby hack. My first, I learned Linux in 1983. And the, my first, and the only reason I did, I was uh, running a, a test department. I was a technician. And I had a requirement to be able to track all of the boards that we were working on in troubleshooting. So I, I, we got up, one of the things we made was a Unix system. So I took a, a version six, actually it was Microsoft Xenix, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. I took Microsoft Xenix and I wrote a database to track all of our test, our board tests in shell script using awk and grep. <laughs> so I wrote a database with awk and grep. It was, you know, it only had to track a few things. It was dog slow, but <coughs> it worked. And that was my first project. Basically my first, I wrote, I wrote a couple of semi-serious projects prior to uh, embarking on Miniben, but basically when I started out I was a, I was really a novice programmer and so that's one of the reasons why some of the things also I took the basis of this from uh, I combined two products Van, uh, this all was created really by Andrew Wilcox came up with the first uh, uh, interchange and it was about 27 K bytes in length had about a couple hundred few hundred lines of code and if you, if you knew what you were looking at, if you'd watched it all, you'd see vestiges of that all the way through, through interchange. And that's part of the reason. Now, if, uh, I think if uh, one, and the reason I'm talking about this is because I recently ran into Dancer, and I've been working a little bit with Dancer over the last year or so. And really, Dancer is interchange as I might have, as I might have written it if I knew what I was doing. And if I had thought about, really had thought about architecture at the very beginning. And because if you look at what Dancer does, the uh, Dancer is a, a system that has action maps. It has the ability to bring in routines. It has, uh, you know, configuration files. It has, you know, dispatching uh, capability. Uh, and it has hooks. That's exactly what Interchange does, and and and, uh, and Dancer and Dancer does it in a clean, very clean fashion. It's Dancer. It's Interchange as would be written for a programmer. And so, if you're a programmer, Dancer, there's a lot to love about Dancer. So, I'm going to talk about a project I've done with Dancer. Uh, one of the problems we've run into uh, uh, with uh, uh, being in e-commerce, and I'm sure all of you have been through this, is PCI. <laughs> Well, uh, PCI, uh, we, have, we have problems with PCI. We have lots of problems with PCI. Most of our problems have to do with sleeping at night. Uh, now, Interchange has been very lucky with credit, car credit cards. Uh, the history of that, of course, is that we made it early on a decision to use PGP and to individually encrypt credit card numbers on Interchange. And basically, and it's, we've been saved by two things. One, Linux is relatively hard to hack. It's not that servers don't get hacked and people don't root systems and get on there and be able to tamper with uh, the software and uh, and but uh, but for the most part because the credit card numbers are not saved to in in the clear they've been been encrypted with PGP uh, Linux is relatively hard to hack you can make the surface area relatively small and so we've been lucky for the most part to not really have had too many major too, too many major breaches uh, with interchange. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, if you really look at PCI and running an interchange system on a PCI system, it's darn near impossible. <laughs> so uh, one of the, if you're gonna comply with PCI really in, in a high visibility project with real due diligence, it is very, very, very difficult to comply with PCI on an interchange system. And uh, so the, uh, we, want, we wanted to lighten the compliance load for the small merchant. Yeah, obviously, if you're, 
if you're using camps and you're pushing things from Git and you're maintaining version control and you're registering things and doing all those types of high overhead things that require many, many people in your company to really truly administer, you can comply with PCI, but it isn't cheap. So our solution is the Prusion Paven server. I'm going to talk about the configuration and the features of, of it. I'm going to talk about its interface with Interchange and a little bit about what we're going to do with it in the future. So uh, basically, uh, uh, the problem of PCI, of course, PCI DSS, the uh, Payment Card Initiative Data Security Standard, was established as a consolidation of the various uh, credit card uh, programs for security in 2004. It really hit in 2006. It was designed to give issuers, banks, merchants, and customers more confidence in credit card security. And uh, compliance is extremely complicated and implementations are open to interpretation, to say the least. If you've ever answered a PCI questionnaire, I think you know what I'm talking about. And with the questionnaires, the current interchange, as implemented in all, almost all instances, requires you to, uh, to uh, answer self-assessment uh, questionnaire C, at least. And if you've been through a self-assessment questionnaire C, you will find it is extremely, uh, 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 extremely detailed. And my guess is that most of you have gone through that questionnaire, closed your eyes, and marked yes a bunch of times in, in some cases. So I think Bill, I don't know if it was Bill who said that or somebody said that, but that's basically it. Close your eyes and mark yes. And, uh, and uh, you know, if you want to honestly answer that questionnaire, and really comply with PCI, it's very, very, very difficult. And handling card data is worrisome in any case. I don't know about you, I, I hate to have birth dates on my system. I, I absolutely detest having social security numbers, and I refuse to have those unless they're encrypted. But I hate to have birth dates, I hate to have any type of identifying information that might, might cause ID theft. And that was the original reason why we did PGP encryption of individual <coughs> credit card numbers this was long before PCI, long before any of that. I did not want to have the liability, and I did not want uh, uh, users to have the liability of having to worry about credit card numbers laying, laying in the clear on their system. And uh, so I'm sure most of you, if you've been in this business very long, you've run across the case. We had, we had one case where we had a customer edit a checkout page, and they did something in JavaScript that actually moved the credit card uh, number variable to another variable which got saved into the interchange values and we found out that every session was getting written with a uh, with a credit card number real unclear credit card number in it i mean you you get you've got problems with it so we <laughs> handling card data is very worrisome at least for me i don't know if anybody else i don't know if anybody else has ever uh uh lost sleep over this but i know i've lost a little bit of sleep worrying that I'm going to end up in the newspaper, and I don't want to be in the newspaper. <laughs> so, and you know, obviously, there are the ways to mitigate this. You can use PayPal. You can use in some sort of a, a gateway. You can use uh, secure.authorized.net and have your own, uh, you know, use one of their APIs and go off to their payment server and have a nicely little, you know, somewhat mostly templated thing where it kind of looks like your site. But it's very difficult to have a fully configurable payment system with exactly what you wanted to have in your checkout uh, process uh, on, on a, one of those external systems. So basically what it comes down to is you have risk, risk, and more risk. If, you're, if you want to do due diligence and sleep at night, at least if you're as paranoid as I am, then, uh, then I worry about these things. And uh, so, uh, so anyway, uh, for small merchants, See, a lot of them, I don't know how many of you have small merchants who have, they have to subscribe to, what, 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 I, I don't even know all the names of these things, Trustwave, Security Metrics, all the various PCI scanning things. They have to subscribe to those, you have to comply with them, your Apache version changes, whatever, they come up with some sort of new test, SSH has a new security hole, you, you leak your SSH port to, to one of your e-commerce IP addresses, et cetera, et cetera. You're just going to have to deal with that. So what you'd really like to do 
is get your all your small merchant uh, small uh, merchant uh, vendors on self assessment questionnaire A, and what self assessment questionnaire A is basically it says, I have no cardholder data on my site. It's not me. And basically, you just answer a few questions. Say no cardholder data. You say who is handling your cardholder data, and say talk to them. So what the Prussian payment server is designed to have somebody to point to when, when on that self-assessment questionnaire you say, talk to them. And the idea would be to talk to Perusian. So, Okay, the Perusian payment server has no data or session storage of any kind. Uh, it could theoretically and uh, be implemented on a read-only file system. In other words, you could just... You could set up your follow-up system as read-only, run it on a DVD or in RAM or you know, whatever, you know, uh, some sort of a read-only file system. Your operating system could be there. All your software could be on a read-only file system. And basically you'd have temp and var log or, or something on some, you could you know, do your syslog to an external system and set up temp, uh, your temp, and, uh, temp files on, uh, in RAM and run. And what that means is if, you're, if you really want to comply with PCI DSS and you don't want to have to have extreme control over your, over your access, et cetera, if you can have a read-only file system and provability for that, that means you don't have to run Cripwire, you don't have to run any of the other system, it may, your audit trail requirements are minimized. You just, it really, uh, 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 that's what we don't want to have to, do any more PCI stuff than we have to do to be able to run this system. So it's based on Dancer. Uh, I, I have uh, designed it to use the card interfaces from business online payment or modified VEN payment modules. So basically if, there's a, if it has a VEN payment module currently, this server will interface with that payment gateway. And we currently have already ported authorized.net, uh, merchant e-store, uh, Merchant e-solutions uh, uh, and uh, uh, maybe uh, Payflow Pro. So it may, those four, but that's just what we have so far. But it, it's very, very. It's a matter of a few minutes to port another one of the Venn payment modules to it. And uh, of course, you can have a direct interface to any web server via Placker or PSGI. Uh, uh, right now, we're using Apache just because we understand it, and it's not that big a it's not that big a load. It can use any template engine. We've used uh, regular template toolkit and the simple template toolkit. We could easily use template flute. So there's no, it's, it's your checkout, your uh, checkout page is designed to be put in any template engine. We provide action map routines for the interchange uh, interface. Basically there's a payment routine and a post back routine, which allows you to implement uh, inter, uh, interface with interchange. And it's easy to have your own pay.yourstore.com uh, because we, all we have to do is have enough IP addresses. We just give you a new IP address, put up your, uh, your cert on that domain, and boom, you're done. Uh, we were provided as a service. We have no release yet. I, you know, I, I learned early. I tried, I've, tr I've probably, I think I've done about eight different open source software projects. And almost all eight of them, I've tried to say, there's no support. Well, if you've ever done this, you discovered that that is simply not valid. You are going to be required to provide support. You can put something out, out there and say, I'm not going to support it, but it's very, very difficult to adhere to that standard. So right now we have, it's provided as a service. We're not going to do release yet. The architecture is basically this. So uh, you have your user out there, and normally he's talking to the interchange server. In our case, we, the, 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 uh, one of the two live things uh, that's uh, uh, out there right now is Perusian.com and payment on that. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the browser would talk to the interchange server and basically go through the normal cart selection process. And in our case, we use a multi-step checkout where they get the shipping address or logged in, then we go to the shipmode.html file with, uh, page, which is the shipping selection step. 
<laughs> and then basically, when we post to that, when we uh, send uh, data to that, to that, uh, to the form action on the shipmode.html file, we actually post to a payment action map. And what the payment action map does is it creates a record in a payment table, which gives us our our the ID number of that record, or what we call the RID, the, the reference ID. And also it assembles the params, which is basically just a hash of whatever you've decided to send to the payment server for its use. Maybe you want to send some cart data to display a cart. More frequently, you might just want to have a total and a shipping and a tax. You, you have the user, the name, You'll need their probably need their address and their zip code uh, for uh, for for uh, ABS requirements, etc. So you're going to send assemble and send some information to the PPS server. What the PPS server does is it receives that and it uses Crypt CBC Blowfish to encrypt the crypt the data the parameters and uh, and then it sends it back to you. So it sends it back to you with the same reference ID that you gave it along with your encrypted data. Of course, if you send it 800 bytes of hash data, it usually uh, when it's encrypted, it's low fish, it'll go down to about 300 bytes. So you get about 300 byte string maybe uh, of data, which is, your, which is your payment data, along with your reference ID. And then what, once it receives the, the uh, uh, payment action map receives this, it uh, uh, takes that same data and it redirects you to the back to the PPS server using that reference ID and data. And so now the, the PPS server receives that at the Dancer PS pay route, and, and it receives and, and decrypts the same data that it had just encrypted and sent to you, and it uses that to populate your payment form, your template. You could use template flute, you could, we use template toolkit as it stands right now, but you could use that uh, data to populate your populate your template form. Now we have a payment a payment form, and the payment form essentially will keep that same encrypted data in one in a hidden variable, along with the reference ID. And then when the user is prompted to insert their card number and expiration date and CVC and whatever else you decide to collect, then we it posts to uh, PS Pay instead of, uh, and, and <coughs> PS Pay will then go out and access the, the payment server. It'll transmit the card data, uh, it'll, et cetera. If, it might check a, a LUN and, a, and an expiration date first, and if it finds an error it can detect, it'll come back and give you an error message, and it will go through the process again. And then eventually, you may decide that uh, the, the user is getting frustrated, they can't get their card data in, we can provide a cancel URL where they can rec redirect back to the server. We also have an error URL where essentially if something happens to the payment server, probably the most common thing would be some sort of a restart, uh, the, uh, uh, then we can redirect back to get them to start the process again. So then we, we, we've decided that they've paid in other words, we've gone to the authorize.net and the capture has been done. And we post the status back to the, back to the server here and we serve them a receipt. Now alternatively, the other process would be if instead you decided to, uh, you did not want to actually do a sale, you wanted to collect some sort of a, a, a token for a warehouse credit card that might be maintained at authorize.net or Braintree or whatever you've decided to use for payment processing, you'll then get that token back to your system, which you can then store in the table that's uh, uh, with your reference ID, and you can go ahead and send them to a finalized page saying, we've got your credit cards, so are you ready to place the order, place the order. And, uh, and, then, and then finally, uh, I'll talk about this a little bit later. Uh, PS Ver, there's a we have a verification <coughs> process where you can verify a card number. I'll talk about that in a little bit. So basically, that's what it. So I'm going to just review that sequence. We generate the reference ID, which is basically we just have inserted a record in the table and gotten the key back. Okay. We post the the key and the payment forms to the pay, Prussian payment server. 
we return the, immediately return the encrypted params and, and the RID to uh, Interchange. Interchange redirects back to the payment server with, with the same data it just got back from it. Uh, it collects and submit, the payment server collects and submits the card data. Uh, it posts the status to Interchange, either failed or, or successful with some sort of a authorization number or a transaction ID, et cetera, or a token. And then uh, Interchange either returns the receipt or asks for a finalized order. Okay, so that's the basic process, very simple. And as you can see, there's no data required because all the data is always passed in those encrypted parameters. And we don't need to store anything. In fact, we don't. <laughs> we just don't. And I, I guess you, theoretically you could not log, but I would, I would typically want to log at least with syslog or something to uh, be able to tell how much activity there is. And the advantages is there, there is no cardholder data on the IC server. Obviously, you have, you'll usually have a credit card reference, the first two digits, the last four digits, maybe a card type and an expiration date. But you have no actual uh, card number that this what is considered to be cardholder data. Uh, there's no risk of a Trojan intermediary because on your, uh, on your interchange server, you have no card data. And that's, of course, is the great fear for anyone who runs an interchange system. If you... Now, I guess if you run Tripwire and you're all, you never do any live edits and you do everything by development and you never, you know, you never do any of that stuff that you're not supposed to do, you might be able to really detect Trojan intermediaries. But even then, it's very, very difficult, very, very difficult to direct, detect a Trojan intermediary. And here you've eliminated all risk of that. You have complete sec sequestration of payment data. It's not on your system at all. And uh, it's only sent to the user and the processor. And talk a little bit about the dancer routes that, that I use to uh, do this. I have a post to PS Inc. And that, that path, of course, can be anything. Uh, receives the written, the name, address, zip, total, and items, whatever's needed. Do we can... We can template anything we want to template. We encrypt the params with Crypt CVC using Blowfish. And uh, the secret is you just we have a secret that is in the vendor configuration file. And that's what is encrypted against that secret. <coughs> um, then we have a get PS pay that receives back the RID and the encrypted params and presents the payment page. That's what it does. And uh, then we, we have a post to PS Pay. It receives, again, the, the re reference ID in the palms, which I won't talk about anymore because it, it's in every form. <coughs> and the card data. It processes the card. And then uh, we have a get PS Bear. Okay, what that does, I, if, you're a, if you're a hard goods shipper and you ship $1,000 systems, you learn to be very, very paranoid <laughs> about where you're shipping things to because there are thieves out there. They will, uh, they will get uh, uh, stolen ID data. They will get stolen credit card numbers. They will get stolen accounts. And they will attempt to defraud you by coming into your system, logging in as a user. And if you, have, if you are using one of the warehouse card systems, where you, where you are storing card tokens and allowing people to charge orders, you know, in the future based upon a saved credit card number, they will attempt to defraud you using that. And particularly if it's large, large high value hardware. And so what you quickly learn to do is never ship to an address that you aren't absolutely sure is your, is your customer. And so that some people use call, do call verification, others do, all sorts of things. But one of the things that Amazon does, which makes a lot of sense, is basically they set up a uh, uh, where you cannot ship to a new shipping address from an old credit card number unless you resupply the credit card number. In other words, you prove you hold that entire number. And you have to reprove that. So if you, you do a new shipping address, you've got cards on file, then they say, okay, well, we need to verify you have your card number. Okay, so what we do is we uh, can return a card MD5 or SHA-1 or whatever we decide to send back along with perhaps 
the, nu the numerals, the ABS data on the uh, address, and we MD5 them together, and then we return that string. When we, when we return that string, we can save that in our payment file. And then later, if we want to verify that the user has the actual card for that address, we can then send that back and, and uh, uh, get, do a get to the PS ver with the reference ID and the card MD5 string. We present the verify page. The verify page will say, please you know, put in your credit card number. It'll then check that against the MD5 sum. Uh, uh, along with the vendor secret uh, is, is involved in this process as well. And, it, and then they'll say, okay, yes, this user has that. And it'll do a post back to the, back to the interchange server and say, yes, that user has that card. Where they've verified that card number. And so that allows you to implement, uh, uh, if you're using warehouse cards, it allows you to implement the uh, shipping address check easily. And let's see. Okay, we have an accounts.yml file. Of course, if, uh, for Dancer, you, this is the way that uh, configurations are, tend to be done. And in, uh, we have a, a config name of Perusian. And here, we the, the, the reference ID is always the first uh, parameter. There is also a hidden parameter in here, which is not shown, uh, which is the MVPayU. And that is the payment user ID. Basically, that's Perusian. <laughs> And then we also have an MVPayS, which is a payment secret that, that you have to ship from your IC server to us. And that, that essentially does a login and says this transaction is coming from Perusian because they've got the user ID, they've got the secret. And then at that point, we, we, pick, the, uh, we pick the parameters which we're going to use to uh, stick in the template. Right now, we have not got, uh, I have not formalized the uh, the, uh, uh, the parameters for a, for a list item, a shopping cart item, but I will have that formalized pretty soon. And then you have your payouts. So that would be your, uh, your ID, your secret, and then your payment <coughs> module. In this case, uh, with Perusian, we still use authorized net. And our payment routine is authorized net, same as in Venn payment. These are essentially hacked versions of the just slightly, very slightly changed versions of just to fit the, the proper environment. I, I was going to try and do a complete emulation, but, you know, log debug, et cetera, et cetera, you know, log error, all that stuff was just, it was more trouble to try and do an emulation environment than it was just to do a few hacks on the, on the thing and test it out. So the, uh, and then we have more of this, and then you can have the MV pay S in this case, it's live fruition key is just what I've got. Um, uh, the, uh, and then your pay view, that's your, that selects your, your template file from your, from, your, uh, uh, from your views directory. If you've used Dancer, you know about views and, and all that. And, uh, <coughs> and then uh, we have a postback jump. These are, the, uh, these are the URLs that we're gonna redirect to or post back to based upon various actions in the payment process. The page title, the company, et cetera, so various things you might wanna do. Uh, with as far as menus, CSS directories, you know, these are just basically uh, configuration parameters that you can use in your uh, in your in your template, and uh, you could have anything you wanted to have. And the action map routines that live on the interchange size, basically payment.am uh, assembles the parameters for sending to the payment server, uh, creates the payment table record, the the reference ID. Uh, it posts to the payment server and it redirects to the payment server. Very simple. It just it's the same every time. You know, it's very, very, very simple. Post back, that is the one that probably has to be customized for most people because what that does is that brings uh, uh, back to your uh, uh, back to your uh, your payment table uh, all of the information, the card markers, if you use a token. Uh, to work for warehouse cards. If you decide you want to have the, the MB credit card reference with the 41 star, star 1111, or whatever, whatever you decided to define. And then uh, it also preps or submits the order. You might just go through an update, you know, if you using the old way of doing the interchange things, you would set your MV to do to submit, 
and do an update process. And that would go through and process your, actually process your order, your log transaction, etc. And boom, there goes your Etsy receipt and you're, and there you're in. Um, and then, uh, but if you're doing, if you're doing a, a if you're doing a warehouse card number where you're then going to present them with a finalized page to our place order now or whatever it happens to be, then you would prep that and mark essentially mark that, uh, that order with an auth to mount. So you would have an amount that's been paid and auth to the card and then you could use that information to eventually uh, 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 prep the order and, and submit the order once they finalize. Okay, here's the payment table that we have on our system. Uh, the reference ID, which is just an auto increment. Uh, we, we include a session ID, a username. We have a T TID field, that's for the transaction ID coming from interchange, uh, the interchange uh, 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 coming back from the, excuse me, from the uh, uh, credit card processor. Uh, then timestamp to figure out when it was created. Uh, we have the post data, which is the, uh, which is the PARMs, encrypted parameters. We have the post back, what, what, uh, what we got is our status on the post back. Uh, we have a, a token, which is how we, we uh, reference the warehouse card data. And then all the, the other stuff should be pretty much self-explanatory. Uh, the only thing that is not maybe is card sum, which is that MD5 value or whatever you've chosen to hash your, your return uh, value, that card sum was the thing you would then verify a card with. And uh, basically that's, uh, and then authorized amount obviously is, is an amount that you can use to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to do in your order processing. Okay, let's see how, I guess I don't even know what I've done on time here. I've probably gone through this pretty well. I guess I'm running close to it. Uh, the uh, uh, summary is that it basically Prusion Payment Server with a minimum of hassle and programming would allow a merchant to answer self-assessment questionnaire, which means that no cardholder data present. Which, so they basically just don't have to have scans. They don't have, they theoretically, you wouldn't even have to have a secure an SSL certificate on your system. You probably want to have it if you have a login page or you're collecting, you know, their name and address, etc. You probably want to use an SSL certificate, but you know, you could probably get away. If PCI wouldn't require it in any case, but probably for just for uh, peace of mind, you want to you want to encrypt login data, and uh, it allows an innocent. Uh, uh, it allows interface with existing IC ported gateways and business online payment. Uh, so basically, it's very if you have a current uh, gateway that you is operational for interchange with very with in less than an hour of work, it can be ported right over to this and dropped in. Uh, 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 flexible template engines by oops, excuse me. <coughs> flexible template engines by Dancer. Uh, obviously, template food is what, something we're going to be looking at, we've decided. And uh, it's built for interchange, but it could be used for any card. I mean, there's no reason that you couldn't have a little API that essentially did the same thing for a PHP card or a, or a Natessi card or whatever it happened to be. And very easy to do. And, uh, and, so, uh, and uh, so it's software as a service, uh, no maintenance or service required. And all the, the PCI self-assessment questionnaire C work is pushed to Perusian. So the scans, uh, all that stuff, we've got all that in place. Uh, we've passed, since we, our surface area is extremely limited, <laughs> uh, we have a port, open port 443 and we have, a, we have an SSH port to one IP address. That's, uh, that's all the surface area we have. And so uh, it's uh, very, very easy to pass an existing scan. Uh, and then uh, uh, basically the security risk devolves to Perusian. So that's it.